All right, welcome back to the decline and fall of Imperial China, part two, the concubine, by me, Mark III, SMLE. Let's talk about concubines. Concubines are women selected for their beauty to begin a sexual relationship with the emperor, and it was normally voluntary with monetary rewards to the girl and her family. This is something that was often associated in ancient Europe, like in Rome, but in any case, it survived in places like the Ottoman Empire and in China until the modern day. The most successful concubine in history is this woman, taking her later age, the star of the show, Empress Dowager Cixi. Before she ascended the throne, she was known as Concubine Yi, and she was the daughter of a minor king official and had the unusual ability to read and write. She helped her emperor, the Zhengfeng Emperor, manage the court while he was sick. But Zhengfeng was very frightened by her and that she might try to dominate court affairs in the future. So much so as drawing up a secret edict given to his wife, the Empress, in case he died and she would try to meddle in the future. However, when he finally did die, the Empress promptly burnt it when she let Cixi know about the edict. As the mother of the Zhengfeng Emperor's only son, she was elevated to Empress Dowager status upon his death in 1861. Before he could even make it back to Beijing after the Second Opium War ended, the Emperor died, leaving his five-year-old son to become the Tongxi Emperor. Before he died, he elevated his Empress Xi'an and his concubine, who had become Cixi, to oversee the boy's regency, with his advisor, So Xin, presiding. A regency is a council of officials or family members that decide a country's affairs until the ruler comes of age and can rule on his own. Since the two empresses were, are vulnerable now that their emperor was dead, they concocted a plan with Prince Gong, his brother, to seize power from the council. So, the Empress Dowagers did not sign off on any of Sushin's actions. And without their approval, Sushin can do nothing. And they used that as an excuse to overthrow him and his council in November of 61, and Sushin was the among those who were executed for treason. Even though Prince Gong and Xi'an were in the picture, Sushin was the most aggressive of them all. Sushin appointed more Han Chinese people to positions of power, Bear in mind, the, the Manchu dynasty were a bunch of Manchus. They were not Han Chinese, but deciding to appoint people who made up the majority of the population legitimized things and made things a little bit better. It included appointing Zheng Gufeng as the head of the army fighting the Taiping. And she also used the 1861 Democratic Progress Reports to get all prominent officials to report to her personally and she had two officials executed to serve as an example to them. Prince Gong was rewarded for appointing Zen as the head of the army but see she wanted to get rid of him so she used a report of misconduct to strip him of all his power in 1865 but the two empresses reinstated him but he would never return to power in a big way again. In 1862 she founded the Gongwen Guan, which was a school for Chinese students taught by Westerners to learn about foreign topics. She even sent the very first Chinese students overseas at this time. Now let's talk about her son, the Tongxi Emperor. He was constantly overshadowed by the two empresses. When he first came of age in 1873, he angered his foreign audiences who would not bow to him. He also ordered that the old summer palace be reconstructed, which was burned by the British and the French, even though the treasury was absolutely spent. This was on the premise of a gift to the two empresses, but in reality, it was a way to sideline them. He also went after his own advisors, his uncles, Prince Chung and Prince Gong. They petitioned the emperor to stop the construction of the palace and to move the funds to things of more immediate concern but instead, the emperor had them both removed from office 
but the empresses managed to persuade the emperor to reinstate them. But he was most famous for sneaking out of the Forbidden City to the brothels of Beijing. He was clearly not one for learning or rule, but in fact his tutor had basically led him to a life of debauchery. And he died unexpectedly in 1875 of smallpox. His empress, who was supposedly pregnant, died mysteriously a few months later. Because he died without any male heir other than a pregnant wife, it caused a secession crisis. But see, she took the high road and selected her four-year-old nephew to become the Gongzhu Emperor. And she adopted him as her own son and as the heir to the Zhengfeng Emperor and not her son, thereby legitimizing the move. He became the Gongzhu Emperor with Xi'an and Cixi as regents once again. But he was basically brainwashed by his tutor, the, who was Tongxi's tutor, Wang Tonghi. How he managed to survive um, is beyond me, but the, the boy emperor was forced to address Cixi as her father. And his tutor brainwashed the young boy into treating the empresses as if they are godlike figures. And here is a picture of the Gongzhu Emperor and his likeness. One of the few photos of him. Now, Xi'an, who was the Zhengfeng Emperor's wife, she ruled alone in the late 1870s when Cixi was ill, and she promptly lost a war with Russia along the border. However, that was not the only significant ruling she did on her own. She died suddenly in 1881, leaving Cixi as the sole regent for the boy emperor. Many believe Cixi had her killed, but Cixi was gravely ill at the time and her involvement isn't very likely. Now the poor performance of the Chinese military against the foreigners convinced Cixi to send students abroad to learn from the West and to bring in Westerners to modernize the military and industries. Among the improvements were battleships, bridge-loading rifles, artillery, and railroads. She also went ahead and purchased British warships, but the British crews refused to leave them. It became an international joke. See, she then turned away from the foreigners and pulled back the students. The new Chinese military would fight the Sino-French War, in which the French sought to have influence over Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, in which they were colonizing, but the Chinese had it as a vassal state. So the French and the Chinese went to war. The Chinese didn't do well on the water because they didn't want to commit their new battle fleet which cost a lot of money. But they did much better on land. France did gain control of Vietnam but little else. But it was ultimately Japanese intrusion in Korea that distracted the Korean government and brought it into the war. But Cixi used the end of this war to finally get rid of Prince Gong. And she promoted Prince Chung, who is the Emperor's real father. To show his loyalty, Prince Chung used naval funds to rebuild the Summer Palace for Cixi's retirement as a sign of loyalty, but also a move to protect his son. There's a, there's a big debate about this. Many believe that Cixi ordered the funds to be used, even though the government was broke. However, it was Chung who did it on his own initiative. There are many myths about Cixi that were later created by her enemies. Cixi married Gongzu to her niece, who would become the Empress Ronglu. And then she went into retirement at the Summer Palace in 1889. But as head of the family, she was consulted on all matters, even by the Emperor. Even though the Emperor now ruled in his own right, he often went to her for advice. But she was often more informed on state matters than he was. And ultimately, it would lead to her continued interference in his rule. The emperor had a whole bunch of trouble. Chinese were attacking Christians and Europeans in the Yangtze River Delta. And this was actually happening all across China. But the foreign powers managed to persuade him to give the Christians imperial protection. But, but his biggest legacy was in 1892. He cut imperial household spending. He wanted draconian cuts, but he had to compromise to maintain Cixi in her palace. In 1894, though, 
The Sino-Japanese War broke out over Korea. Here are Japanese troops firing their rifles during the war. Now, the Korean king was a vassal to the Chinese emperor, but, but his government was being influenced by the Japanese. The Chinese under Ron Shikai threw out the Japanese reformers and basically restored the Korean king in 1885. But Shikai was asked to help the Korean king once again in 1894, and that sparked the war. The war went badly for China. Most of their battle fleet, which they spent lots of money on, was sunk. China lost Korea as the vassal state, and Taiwan was finally taken away from the Chinese as well after many attacks from the Westerners. And also China had to open ports to Japan, and China's effort to modernize was hindered by corrupt officials who were pocketing the funds even during wartime. And even when the Chinese military got their new weapons, they didn't know how to use them because the military command structure was very outdated. Gongzu, like any other emperor, had concubines. Jin and Zen were both selected by Cixi to be his concubines. This is a photograph of Zen. However, they were causing trouble. They were spending all their time with the emperor, and the emperor was neglecting his empress. And in 1894, Cixi had Zen flogged and banished the two sisters from the city for interfering in court politics. But they were then reinstated, but they were excluded from politics ever after. And with the end of the war in Korea sparked a number of concessions, in 1897, two German missionaries were murdered by anti-foreign terrorist groups near Xingdao. It was used as an excuse for the Germans to take over the area. And today, Xingdao is most famous for its brewery. But it also inspired other foreign powers to get what they can get from the Qing Dynasty. Ultimately, the emperor was desperate for change to make things better. He wanted to learn from Japan who had just been through their own modernization because of contact with the West. Gongzu surrounded himself with progressive reformers like Kan Yue. But also, the emperor was in on a plot of the side advisors to kill Cixi to keep her from interfering with the reforms that were going to take place. The Hundred Days reforms happened between June and September of 1898. Gongzu initiated those reforms it included the following, modernizing the civil exams, eliminating government welfare for politicians. In other words, if you don't work, you don't get paid. He modernized the educational system in which Confucianist texts were out, new stuff was in, rapid industrialization, changing the military command structure, and last but not least, creating a constitutional monarchy with elections. But the Manchu conservatives were opposed to the reforms because it was a threat to their power, it could have been too much too fast, and foreign powers could have been behind it, in which they were. Plotters attempted to get Wan Shikai's modern army to back the reforms, but he backed Cixi instead, and worst off, he told her about the emperor's plan, and this happened. In September of 98, in the midst of the reforms, the Gongzu Emperor had an audience with Ito Hirobumi, the former Japanese Prime Minister, whom he had secret talks with. After the audience, Cixi had her son arrested, knowing the plot all along. And knowing the foreign powers would react if Gongzu was killed, she had him placed under house arrest and forced him to incriminate the plotters, but not himself. Cixi wanted everyone to think that Gongzu wasn't going to sell out the country. So instead, she had him sign documents condemning the plotters for planning to kill him and Cixi instead of just Cixi. And he also signed stuff saying that he was now under Cixi's guardianship. And Khan and the other plotters fled for their lives. They were trying to get Western backing, but ultimately, the West would not intervene and unseat Cixi. She sent the emperor to the Yingtai Pavilion, surrounded by walls and water, with only a guarded causeway linking him from the outside world. And he was only allowed to get out with Cixi present. He would have audiences with Cixi, but ultimately he would wield no power again. Militia groups were attacking Christians all around the same time. 
Chinese Christians, and Europeans. Now, the most famous of them was the Militia United for Righteousness, or the Boxers as they're known in America and Europe. They were a group of anti-foreign fighters who were believed to be immune from modern weapons. Their goal was simple, to get the foreigners out. Here are boxers on the campaign trail. In 1900, Sishi stopped suppressing the boxers and started to support them. Meanwhile, Christians and foreigners who were becoming under increasing pressure and being attacked, they ran off to Beijing to their respective embassy for protection. And troops stationed there fought off a boxer siege of the legations. Sishi declared war on the eight nations involved in June 1900, but ultimately, Wan Shikai and other generals who commanded the most modern armies in China refused to back the boxers, leaving most of China out of the war. An invasion force of mostly British troops, they relieved the legations in August of 1900. Russian troops had invaded Manchuria and the Chinese army was soon out of Beijing and on the run. Here's an illustration of US Marines defending the American litigation. The Germans and the Americans occupy the most hard hit of the, of the besieged. For the second time in her life, Sishi fled to Xi'an. She, the Emperor Gongzu, and entourage were leaving Beijing with the foreigners hot on their trail. Consort Yen banged for Gongzu to be left behind to deal with the foreigners and negotiate an end of the war. But Sishi responded that the foreigners would probably would rape her and that she should probably kill herself. She then begged to be taken with Sishi, but instead she was thrown down a well before leaving Beijing. Now there's debate whether Sishi ordered her to be thrown down the well and killed, or whether the eunuchs themselves. In any case, Sishi was already out of town before it happened. Here is a picture of foreign troops in Beijing. You can see the various countries involved. A very diverse group of the Eight Nations Alliance. The foreigners under German command occupied Beijing and other coastal ports and they hunted down the boxers. Meanwhile, messages back and forth between Sishi and the foreign powers continued and ultimately the King Court would sign the boxer protocols in 1901. Even though Sishi's advisors urged her to keep going with the war because the Chinese military was not beaten. However, the terms were lenient enough to allow her basically to stay in power. They were to pay an indemnity of silver to the Eight Nations Alliance, consisting of the U.S., Britain, France, Germany, Russia, Austria-Hungary, Italy, and Japan. China emerged far from beaten in the Boxer Rebellion, but so and some foreign demands actually went unanswered. Sishi, meanwhile, and the emperor returned to Beijing in 1902, and she immediately started reform. It included many of the reforms that Gongzhu was trying to push back in 1898. She abolished civil examinations and foot binding. Sishi herself was a victim of foot binding, in which the foot is bent backwards to not allow a woman to move outside the home. So, setting the framework for a constitutional monarchy that Gongzhu so desperately wanted, including elections for the first parliament in 1916. So, the Empress Dowager allowed herself to be photographed for the first time, including her, the likeness of the imperial court, and China itself. Here is a picture of the Empress Dowager with the wives of the American delegation. See, she became gravely ill in November 1908 and was saddened not to be able to meet her fellow Buddhist, the Dalai Lama who had came to Beijing to meet with her on plans to repel the British out of Tibetan territory. The Emperor Gongzhu, who was still under house arrest and very much spied on, he died mysteriously. He died an agonizing death on November 14, 1908. And with that, Xi Shi immediately put two-year-old Puyi on the throne and Gangzu's empress, Rong Lu, as the regent who would decide the state affairs until he grew old enough. Then she started putting the state's affairs into order, including her will, and she even wrote the emperor's will as well. But she would die the next day at the age of 72, leaving China without solid leadership. Forensics? 
Yes. In 2008, 100 years after the Emperor's death, Emperor Gongzu's remains were examined and it was found to have up to 2,000 times the lethal dose of poisoning all at once. This confirms many rumors that he was poisoned. Many historians believe Cixi, who feared her intimate death was coming, poisoned Emperor Gongzu so that he would not be able to carry out his reforms after she was dead. But in any case, the Qing Dynasty and China as a whole was left in limbo without the strong will of Cixi behind the throne. Emperor Dowager Cixi never met her male advisors. She talked through a silk screen, which became the epitome of the phrase, rule behind the curtain. Through deceit, torture, murder, negotiation, and outright shrewdness, she managed to hold China together in this desperate time. However, knowing full well her dynasty was on the ropes. Will China survive? Find out next.